I was born in Brandon, Manitoba in 1924. Uh, we came out to BC in the 30s with my family, which was eight of us in an old 1927 Essex. And we landed in Burnaby and and from then on in, I've been a Burnaby and in Lower Mainland uh, citizen since then. I joined the Navy in 1943. And uh, where I joined, ironically, was there was an old Vancouver hotel on the corner of Granville and Georgia. And that's where I joined the Navy. There's a... Uh, a yacht club right at the entrance to the park. And that's where we had all our, our, our issues of gear and all that we ran from there all, and doing our, our general uh, uh, exercises and getting to know Navy life. So we, took, we did a lot of different exercises right in Stanley Park. And they transferred me to uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia and Halifax, where I underwent uh, extensive training in gunnery and ASDEC and seamanship and et cetera. Uh, they, uh, they transferred me or they drafted me to a Corvette called the Kitchener K225, which was in dry dock at Liverpool, Nova Scotia. And all the crew were new, the captain was new, everybody was new except one or two uh, people on board. They sent us to Bermuda as a shakedown cruise to get to know the ship and seamanship. And, uh, and as, as I remember, it was one of, the, one of the worst trips we've had because it was right in the hurricane season, you might say. <laughs> and uh, so it was pretty rough. Anyway, it's... It, it got us to, to know what it was like on a Corvette. <laughs> and it rolled like a cork, uh, a, you know, from the standpoint of going after uh, U-boats, they were excellent because they weren't fast, but they had the armament and the abilities to pick up pretty, pretty good. They sent us into a scap of flow just off of Scotland with a, another batch of ships. And uh, we went through exercises that, that they figured you needed in order to go out on the North Atlantic and know what to, to do if a sub was to surface and etc. So we had planes and ships and, and uh, submarines and everything. And we went through all this extensive stuff where if we brought a sub up, you had to learn how to board that sub and take it over from the enemy for about, oh, two weeks. Uh, well, they sent us into uh, uh, Plymouth Harbor, where we tied up alongside of the USS Augustus, which was Omar Bradley's flagship. And he was responsible for the, both the American beaches. None of us knew, nobody knew, that there was going to be a big uh, D-Day of any description. We didn't know that and probably they kept it so quiet. They, they did all kinds of dubious things to uh, fool the Germans. They, uh, they, put, uh, they built uh, rubber tanks and painted them to look real stuff and hundreds of them in, all in, in packs. So when they took pictures, it looked like, hey, they're going to have a, a big storm come up here on that. And so that, they did all kinds of things like that. And how they kept D-Day so secret, it's hard to know. But uh, certainly they did. And the Omaha Beach was where they designated uh, as being the hardest beach to take. And so we went over to, on the early 6th of June. We went over with the Augustus to France, uh, partly because we had to protect the, the, uh, the Augustus from submarines and whatnot. So we did that. When we got over to, to France, 
we, we landed there on the beach, but our job while we were there was to protect all these fellows on the barges landing on the beaches. And I'll tell you, it was something awful because the Omaha beach, because it was the worst beach, the reason for that was it had a embankment that the, that the soldiers had to climb after they went through all the uh, obstacles and water and everything on the beach. They had to climb this, this uh, I guess it was a wall of stone, and they had to climb that on, and they had devised rope ladders that they had to climb to get at the Germans. And uh, mind you, the Air Force was doing their job too, the flotilla that we were with, as it's actually depicted in writings, as being the largest uh, flotilla of its kind in the history of our world. Uh, we were the only Canadian Corvette to reach the beaches on D-Day, so I understand. I was on an anti-aircraft Orlikan gun on the bridge with the captain, and uh, we were all pretty frightened on what was going to happen. We had six Orlikan guns on board our ship, but uh, the one that was the most important, I guess, was three of them on the starboard side of the ship. So at one time, at one point, the captain mentioned to me, good ship, good shooting, Cameron. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> But uh, the point is, you know, we were all very frightened about it. There's no doubt about that, especially when the aircraft were coming right at you. But my job was to shoot as many aircraft as we could down and to protect these guys landing on the beach. Uh, I think we lost three ships in the English Channel, one destroyer and two corvettes. And we, it looked like we were going to buy it too for a while, but on the, uh, the, the ship was banged up very bad. We did have some injuries, but no, we didn't lose any men on our ship. And I think that one reason why we came through that, our captain was very, very good at uh, maneuvering our ship so that they couldn't really get a bead on us properly. Although when those German planes were coming at you, uh, that, <laughs> That was scary, believe me. But on the other hand, you know, I'm only 20 years old, and there was three of us on this gun. I'm on the trigger end of it. And uh, when they were coming right at you, I'll tell you, <laughs> but you know, we had a job to do. And I guess you just forgot all about the consequences of what could happen. I, I guess I'll never see another situation like that again, I don't think, because it was the largest one that they've ever had. But so anyhow, after we spent, oh, probably 10 hours on the beach, and uh, they decided that they'd already, they had taken the beach away from the Germans. I guess they directed uh, Omar Bradley back to England, so we left with the, with the cruiser and protected it on the channel. You see, in the channel, the Germans had full control of all their shipping until they ran out of uh, ammunition and whatnot. But for quite some time, they were still quite active in the channel, even though they, they were working their way as best they could, the soldiers back into Paris. So we had to run from Milford Haven, Wales, which was our headquarters. We ran from there all the way up to, to the English coast on different trips protecting ships. And uh, from until the end of the war. And then of course, kind of the end of the war, we, I think we were the first Canadian ship that Milford Haven ever saw, <laughs> sailors wise. So we, uh, we left there when the war was over and we landed back in Halifax. Then there was a handful of us that were designated to help take the ship up to Sorel, Quebec, where they 
uh, ushered all the ships that were being decommissioned. On the way up, we had to throw all kinds of stuff over the side that they didn't want to keep. And uh, so when we got up to Sorel, Quebec, that's when I was drafted uh, back home to BC. <laughs> and then I guess it was 19, 1946, I guess, when I came out of the, out of the Navy. Life on a Corvette, well, it was considered one of the wettest ships in the Navy because it, it could stand, it was built on, uh, actually on the concept of a British whaler. Consequently, the ship could take an extremely rough weather. And so it was, you know, always at sea, uh, you always had an awful lot of water on the mess deck you know, two or three inches of water floating around because every time that ship, the folks forecastle would, would uh, dip into the ocean, it would disappear. And when it come back up, all that water was washed down a lot of the vent tubes. So <laughs> it was pretty disastrous that way. We would uh, have to sleep with our clothes on, have a pair of, of gum boots at, at the end of the, of the hammock, and uh, when that alarm would go off, when they contacted a sub, when that alarm went off, boy, you had to get up on that deck as quickly as you could and get onto a position of, of uh, protecting it. It was very delightful because my girlfriend of the time, which became my wife, we knew each other all through high school, and she hung around and waited for me till I got back. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was kind of nice. Remember, I remember leaving uh, on the train way back when, when we headed to, to Nova Scotia, and my wife running alongside of the train didn't want me to leave. <laughs> I guess every now and again, she'd send me parcels and letters and that. So at one point, there's a parcel there. All, my, all the mail came over the side, and uh, I had a parcel there that was all about a foot in diameter and round, and the paper was all half off of it. I undone this, and it's a beautiful fruit cake. So uh, I thought, because we used to have, uh, we didn't have any refrigeration enough to keep our bread, so they, it would go quite moldy in no time, and then you were on to, on to what they call hardtack. And uh, so I thought, oh boy, I won't have to eat hardtack for a while. About a week later, we're out in the middle of the channel and uh, we come off watch about two in the morning with about six other guys. And, and so one of them said, okay, Cameron, where's that cake? Oh, well, I haven't got any cake. Oh yeah, you have. <laughs> so, how it came out of the locker and that disappeared in no time flat. So now I'm back to hardtack again. <laughs> like at Juno Beach, they really, that was first class. What they did there was excellent. But you know, the thing is, when you say what I want to be remembered for, well, I look at it this way. You know, uh, at my age, to think back that I went through this hectic time and came out of it alive, it, it's something to be very thankful for. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's how I would like future generations to think of, of myself as being very appreciative to be able to have come back home after all that and still stand. <laughs> <laughs>